My name is Janetta Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of TGIJP, which stands for Transgender Gender Variant Intersex Justice Project. And I live in San Francisco, originally from Tampa, Florida, moved there in 1997. And my pronouns are she, her, and I could go with a little bit of they, them. What does reproductive justice look like for black trans people and why is it important? It's a very interesting conversation because I, being here and remembering when I was like 17 or 18 and I knew that I was trans and I knew that I was going to take the hormones and stuff and I remember it clearly like I wish there was some way I could save my sperm so that one day I could have a kid and then fast forwarding to now where there are, um, there are, I'm not going to say, I don't know exactly if there's access to that right now in the capacity, but I'm sure it is. But I realized that then there was no way that that could be, like, that conversation would have been totally shut down. But I feel like now we do have an opportunity where we should start thinking a lot more about reproductive justice and um, how can we, um, how can we, like really come up with um, different ways of ensuring that trans people have better access and information on reproductive justice. I was actually just talking to somebody that was having not an SRS surgery, but a different kind of surgery and um, discussing with them that they should consider um, saving their semen because they're having some problems around the genital area and I was like well maybe this would be a great opportunity to see if you because they don't know what the outcome is going to mm. be in because of the health problem and I was just sharing with them maybe this might be a good time for you to talk to your doctor about how can you um, make sure that in the future if you want to have a child because they don't know how this um, surgery is going to come out. That was amazing that you were able to have that conversation and share that information and insight with them. Yeah. Something that otherwise might not have been shared to them and they would not have. I think it's profound that that same thing that you faced being a young person, mm -hmm. that to think people are still not getting to think about, like the value of our families or our futures, because we're just so focused on our, the basic things that we still need, you know? But that's such an important thing that some folks might not even be thinking about. I work with some young people and they, I feel like there, there was a pressure that was put on me as a young black trans woman to transition to be female so that I could work and make money as a sex worker, you know. And um, that was during a time where a lot of people were using a lot of different silicone things. They didn't know what they was using. All they knew is if I had titties, I might be safer. You know, uh, if I had some type of facial enhancement, I might be safer and as a as a woman. But it's just like I'm working with some young people, and they're like um, going through this little determination, trying to figure out where they want to be on the spectrum. And I'm like, take your time. It's not like it was 1980 when I came out as a trans person. It was just like you were either man or woman. You better hurry up and get out there and be one or the other. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like. You get to play around. You don't have to take hormones. But, um, take hormones, you get to decide what it looks like. You know, I feel like in a lot of ways, it was already decided back in the day. It was already decided that if you say you were trans, you automatically dressed as a woman 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you came out of that, you weren't really who you are. And I'm encouraging younger people to take their times and, you know, check into the um, new health options and everything in terms of before they start taking hormones or whatever. Because it's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, even within our community, community is putting on community, like, you know, community is telling, a 18 year old trans woman is telling a 19 year old trans woman, if you're not dressing as a woman every day, then you're not a woman. And I don't want you to walk down the street with me because you get me clocked. Mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, no, no. Take your time, do your thing, decide. You figure it out. Don't, you know, you will know. But sometimes it's really strange that we're still there, like still in that place where people are pressuring people. And I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it just makes me think about what you were talking about in the 80s, how there was this pressure to be either or, 
and then also like the how that pressure still applies today in a lot of different ways even though there has been so much progress in organizing around policies and as you were saying like medical interventions and stuff i'm always shocked in some ways i guess by it because we faced it <laughs> and i just you know you would think god have you made it that far that you forgot what it felt like to not feel enough of something or be told you weren't enough of something and you know it just yeah it feels like will that ever go away or something so it's interesting that that's been a you know reality for a long time but I think for a lot of young people people don't explain to them that it's okay to wait like it's okay to wait it's okay to wait, you know what I mean? And I, I sometimes I often think, you know, I wish I would have had a lot more time to think this thing through a lot a lot more. And don't get me wrong, when I was younger, I did make, I did say to myself, I said, you know what, I'm not gonna try this silicone thing until I'm 40. And I don't know, for whatever reason, I was afraid of it, or, but it was just like, okay, that's one thing I'm gonna do, is I'm not gonna try the silicone thing like 40 because there was a lot of pressure to have silicone when I was in my 20s a lot mm. of pressure mm. and it was all about making more money and looking more glamorous you know all the things it's so many different sides like um, some doctors are pressuring people to have all these surgeries and some doctors are saying if you don't want to have the bottom surgery, there's no need to have the other surgeries. And I feel like I'm I'm kind of like in a situation right like that right now, because I don't want to have bottom surgery. It's just like the doctors don't have an interest at me up on me in Kaiser, and it's just like they were like, well, there's no need for you to do this, and there's no need for you to do that, and I'm like, but I'm too tired to fight with them, so I'm not fighting with them. Um, <clears throat> And uh, in other areas, there's um, uh, one of the girls was just telling me the other day, her doctor says, oh, we can't give you hormones because you're too old. And she's only 61. She's only 61, telling her she's too old to have surgery. And one of my, one of my girlfriends here was telling me that lives here, she was just telling me that her doctor will um, only give her one pill and she's like, oh, girl, you know I'm not going to give you that. And I was like, girl, I would have been evil. <laughs> I said I would have been evil. But I think a lot of people, based on where you live or what information mm. you have, and um, that's why she made it acceptable. But I'm like, girl, I would have probably flipped the damn table over and told her, she, yeah. But Still subjected to other people. Um, other people's values and thoughts about our transition and what is the right way or the process we should be doing or going through. So it just makes me think about, uh, it just makes me think about the um, like interventions that people take um, outside of the medical industrial complex like silicone and stuff like that, why it's so important for them to self-determine in different ways or they feel it's um, empowering because you don't have someone else telling you what to take or the process. <sighs> yeah, I go to Kaiser and I'm having an issue with Kaiser right now because I would like to have um, Fraxel done on my face mm. to remove my beard shadow. Mainly, I really feel like the only reason I really want Fraxel is for a safety issue mm -hmm. because of the fact that I travel a lot and I enter a lot of spaces and um, but um, but my doctor won't give it to me and I've been using this little home remedy that I bought off of Amazon and as you can see my face is really like scarred up right here and that's mm. where that comes from and I just did a test of a home remedy but and that's because my doctor refused me and I just don't feel like fighting I, it seems like I fight for every damn thing in my life and so at some point in time I'll go back and I'll get my needs met and then I know it'll be I'll just have to, and it, I don't want to go that route, but I'm going to have to go in there and I'm going to have to be tough and I'm going to have to be stern and I'm going to have to just talk hella shit and get my needs met. And it feels like that is so common being a trans woman. That is so common being a black trans woman. 
that's just so common. Being black and trans, period. Mm -hmm. In order to get your needs met, sometimes you have to just be like, fuck this shit, I need my shit, and either you're gonna give it to me or not. So I'll probably go up, go in there and just kind of like show her my face and be like, okay girl, this is the deal. You were gonna do my shit, that's it. Yeah. I'm not gonna argue. Like that home remedy, <clears throat> like you got me doing all these other things while there's something that is in place to support me and my, and my medical needs and my insurance your insurance paid, but very well you know i have insurance that covers all these things what does it mean to follow black trans leadership and that's what i struggle with right now in my workspace what does it mean to follow black trans leadership and and that it, it means just that I'm not the face of the organization. I am leading this organization. I have worked my ass off over the past 22 years. Ms. Major, who is my mother, who has trained me to be in the position that I'm in and trust me in the position that I'm in. And she has many, many daughters that she could have put in that position and she chose me. And I often have to tell my staff that you're going to follow my leadership. You're going to follow formerly incarcerated black trans leadership. You may have read all the books about trans women, but I've sat and met with from the jailhouse to the crack house mm -hmm. to the whole house to the bridge. I mean, I've always studied my community. I always under try to understand how to bring us out of these disparities. I've always taken the time out to listen to their stories. I've always taken the time out to try to figure out how how do we how do we take all this trauma and all this negative stuff that we have and build something um, better for ourselves. And I'm leading this organization. And I and if if I'm leading this organization, you're gonna follow black trans leadership or you're not, you know, it's like, it's just, that's just the way it is. It irritates me that people go all around the world and say, cis people go all around the world and tell other people and tell white people, follow black trans leadership, follow black trans leadership. Well, we right here now, follow black trans leadership. You know what I mean? And it's the same people that go around and speak in the rhetoric and I, I call them on it. I'd be like, yeah, I remember you when you remember what you said, then you need to follow suit because it's like it's not going down. And I talk with Miss Major and she like, I just know I'm on the path and I'm doing the work that it's called for me to do and the work that she trained me to do. Miss Major has always shared with me her vision, the future for black trans women and, you know, sort of kind of like wrote the narrative of how to build for us and <clears throat> it's like I still struggle with people that I work with within our organization that feels like they don't have to follow black trans leadership or they know more than I do and I, I they maybe do have more academia background than I do but lived experience and working with the community and even when I didn't even know I was working in the community, I thought I was surviving in the community. I didn't know I was working in the community when I lived in Florida, but every time I found a good thing or a good resource or a good door open, I, I go back and tell the girls, come on girl, let's go. But this is how we gotta go. We gotta go this way, we gotta go that way. You know, we gotta get in, however we get in, you know. So it's like, I just feel like um, working in the um, nonprofit, industrial complex is a very challenging work and um, sometimes it can be hard working with um, other trans folks that are uh, more mainstream mm -hmm. society than like when we're there, we're 6'1", six 6'2", six size 11, 12 pump, you know, we out there, you know what I mean? It, we are who we are. But it, it's really challenging and and people that have academia background think they know way more than mm. what we know or what I know or like, and I know I work with this community, I studied this community. When I spent three and a half years in that prison, my mind says focus on reentry, recidivism, how you got there, how do you support your community and never returning back into a situation in a system like that. 
what information do I need to tell them to make them understand? Like, a lot of people don't have all the information. A lot of people don't know how much money the prison industrial complex is making on their backs. You know what I'm saying? And it's just that information helps a lot of trans women, like, really be like, oh, for real? Like, oh, that, that makes sense. You know, these people, ain't, I'm not going to put myself in a position where they can earn this type of income off of my demise. So it's just, it's complicated. It's like a... Um, it's not loyal in a lot of ways, um, and sometimes asking for help is very difficult. So it's kind of like we're trapped, and we. I think sometimes some of us still live with the fear of being without, and if, especially if we've experienced homelessness, disparities, and stuff like that. You know, I, I experienced homelessness, you know, serious substance use, and. I don't think I could ever, ever live on the street again. I mean, because it's just, I mean, I've it had that experience and it's just like, and we never really make enough money to save. How you, I struggle. Hmm. I struggle. Everybody thinks that I'm just like the strength and I'm like, I'm like, lately I have been going to bed at five o'clock in the evening, just exhausted, and just getting ready to fight the next day. I'm like, if I'm gonna fight tomorrow, I gotta go to bed at five o'clock, hmm. you know? But it's, it seems like every time we feel like we're safe, or we have some sense of comfort, something comes in and disrupts our sense of safety and sense of peace and sense of security. I mean, particularly, even with the you know, our president always, you know, coming for us. Yeah. It's like, damn, I thought you had done took every damn thing you could take. <laughs> well, I think a lot of the organizing that, um, particularly black trans women, in my experience, that black trans women have done, I mean, um, coming together and just having conversations and sharing different information and just the the personal the, the 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 personal empowerment that I receive coming to certain convenings and certain spaces where you know there are some black women are doing like some major leadership roles in their cities and counties and states and um, that has changed because we never gather in that way and um, particularly one of the most amazing things that I love that really really inspires me is the uh, younger trans women that are like um, as some people would say have some semblance of wokeness mm -hmm. and um, that are be that are involved in doing the work that they're doing to me that that makes me feel good and that makes me have a little bit of sense of safety that particularly a person that's aging um, mm -hmm. to know that uh, these girls are getting the information uh, around um, trans rights and trans visibility and sort of kind of using their platforms in some ways, in some very good ways of visibility. Um, I would say Let's put all the bullshit to the side and get together and have one low, low down um, convening and just really, really talk and really, really support each other and really, really exchange information. I mean, one thing that I would like to say to black trans women all over the world my goal is to, right now I'm working on a project which is a uh, um, transition of housing for trans women coming out of jails and prison so that they can have immediate access to housing opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's no question about where they're gonna go. They have a place to stay. But also making a, um, working on a restaurant management training program and um, opening it up to a full-blown restaurant starting by catering. But once we build that, I would like to take that. Once we build that and get that functioning and part of the proceeds will go in a specific um, place, 
so that we can take this model and take it to Tampa, Florida, or take it to Alabama. Because we have to start building built businesses. Mm -hmm. We have to have our own businesses. Um, we have to have our own homes. I mean, we don't own homes. A lot of us don't. I mean, how many black trans women do y'all know own their own home? Trans women. No. We don't own our own homes. We need to own our homes. We need to have stake in this world. We need to have stake. Like, like we have the Transgender Cultural District in San Francisco, which is kind of iffy, but it's mm -hmm. just like the whole point was is we have to have historical landmarks. We have to have stake in this world. Mm -hmm. We have to have our own businesses in this world. We need to, and I'm not trying to normalize us, it's just that we need ownership. Ownership does not, we don't own, we need ownership. Like, y'all need your own production company. Like, y'all need your own company, like the building and the design and everything that y'all, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We need to own our own stuff, you know? And that's where I want us to go, is to have ownership, you know? Hmm. Just imagine what would it be like to have your own home I mean, yeah. your own home that's paid for. It's your home. You worked hard for it, you know. No, it would be powerful. I think it's so powerful that you share it, that you share this now. I want to share something about my journey too. It's you mentioned the restaurant thing and on point and I'm in the process of starting or coming together to bring about a school, like a cosmetology school for the girls for that same exact reason. Like we're thinking about recidivism, right? Or re-entry and we're thinking about like, okay, if the girls are, of course, systematically put in place to be incarcerated, okay, what do we have in place to disrupt that? Do we have some sort of community service plan, which will be the school? Can this be a form of like, um, like, like an alternative um, to incarceration? So when you said that, I was just like, this is so true, like I am really on it. I'm really, I need to do that. I need to follow through with that for real. And that's I'm how so we deep. started our re-entry program. It's just like, so now when a girl gets out of prison, she can um, start working with us um, with leadership development. I mean, it's, it's leadership development and job training and a lot of things, but for starters, you get paid $15 an hour, 25 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, and it's your job. You're an employee, just like I'm an employee. But it's a, uh, it's a, um, because traditionally trans women don't have access to employment. I mean, I spend time in jail. You hear guys say, "Oh, my uncle owns this. Or I got my job back," and da da da. Trans women don't have nobody to go home to. They don't have nothing. And I'm like, okay, we'll, we gotta start somewhere. So we'll start with these positions. So we created five positions at $15 an hour, 25 hours a week. And they have the opportunity to work their way up to any position within the organization that they choose, that they can do. And who's ever in that position that is not trans and not formerly incarcerated, it is their duty to train them in those positions. So if they have an interest in being trained in those positions and eventually, they can take over that position so that person that is not formally incarcerated and has academia background can take over that position. Mm. So we have to tap into our creativity and bring, especially when we're talking about formerly incarcerated trans women, because we need more trans women to be here with us mm -hmm. and to be a part of this fight and a part of this movement and a part of this building that we're trying to build. Right. You know what I mean? And um, and so that's my whole point, is I'm trying to keep people on this side because we need them. We need them to build out here, you know? Mm. Oh. Oh.